So um, the main question, uh, so this is the logo of my lab. Um, and um, so I, I work at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin. And I'm part of this iSearch lab, um, iSearch stays for information search, ecological, and active learning research with children, which is very long. That's why I'm really happy we managed to condense it in only one word. And the main question we're interested in is how young children learn so much about the world so fast, so quickly. Uh, and a rich body of research um, now has demonstrated that the active engagement with the world is really a crucial component of children's ability to learn. And as soon as they can sit or walk, infants start grabbing things, manipulating objects, avoiding or approaching people. And as language develops, young children start asking questions. What is that? Why did that happen? How, how would you do this? And so on. So they try to learn by asking questions about all the new and puzzling phenomena they encounter. Um, so here, uh, so that was my main question, and here are more like the sub-questions my lab is working on. So what does active learning mean? Are children good active learners? Uh, is there a developmental trajectory for active learning? Um, and how does active learning develop across the lifespan? Can active learning be used as a social cue? And what are the cognitive, educational, and cultural factors contributing and impacting active learning? And um, finally, is active learning beneficial as compared to more passive forms of instructions, thinking about the traditional kind of classroom engagement activities? So today I'm going to focus, so considering the kind of stress on methods that this workshop has, I'm going to focus on uh, the second question, that is, are children good active learners? And uh, we're going to try to focus in particular on one aspect of efficient learning that is what I call ecological learning. Uh, ecological learning has to do with adaptiveness, so the ability to kind of change strategies depending on the situation we're in. So um, more precisely, ecological learning is uh, a framework that considers on one side the cognitive developmental phase of the child and on the other side, the characteristics of their specific learning environment. So ecological learning studies how children learn by exploiting the ecology. That means uh, how sensitive they are and how good they are at detecting the characteristics of the environments and the problem they're trying to solve, and whether they're able to adapt their learning strategies to achieve maximum efficacy in the problem they're trying to solve. And to investigate ecological learning, um, I use information search paradigms, that is, tasks or games in which children and adults uh, have to actively search for information in their environment in order to solve uh, categorization tasks or causal inferences or make decisions. And in particular, I got very fond of the 20 questions game, or the guess who game. Do you know it? Great. Puzzling faces. We're going to play together. So here's some animals, and the goal of the game is trying to find the one animal I'm thinking of uh, by asking as few yes-no questions as possible. That's it. Go. Yes. Is the animal brown? Is the animal brown? <laughs> Going on to colors with this. Um, no. Is it dinosaur? Yes. <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> Uh, several dinosaurs. We're not, we're not yet there. Yeah, is it four legged? It is four legged, yes. Does it have horns? Does it have horns? Nope. Drum roll. Oh. Is it green? Yes. It the Therefore, <laughs> it must be the brontosaurus. Very well. So I think you can see why I like this kind of um, game so much and why I think it's such a fruitful. Um, and uh, fertile, um, like research paradigm, you can see that you can work with many things here. So like we tap onto um, children vocabulary, uh, onto children's ability to categorize objects, flexibly categorize objects, and also with children's ability to plan uh, more generally and also to formulate questions. So like all these kind of skills are kind of involved into this. But there is even more to that than, um, than what I just told you. So, um, I mean, this is just one way you could go around that. 
There are lots of ways you could have solved this task. Um, obviously, going for a dinosaur is a good idea if you think I might be into dinosaurs, which obviously I am because I'm working with children, so I kind of get into that eventually. Uh, but probably the best way to go about this task would be to try to ask a question, right, that kind of targets half of the objects, and then try to partition to the rest of the objects half half, and so on. And then obviously, when you have only two objects, you can discuss. Hmm? We're gonna. Um, play a little more later so you get some more experience. So um, what do we know about children asking questions? Well, first of all, we, we know that children ask tons of questions, right? So there is this uh, study that really tried to record and track how many questions children ask, and the rate is about 70 to 80 questions per hour, which is like a whole lot. Of course, lots of these questions are why questions, which can be repeated at very very, very high pace. <laughs> why, 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 why? Um, but the idea is that children do not just ask questions. They ask questions because they want answers. So their question asking behavior is not just random, it's really, um, it does really have a concrete intention underlying it. And the intention is to try to resolve some kind of detective inconsistency, to seek explanation, to find solutions to problems. Um, so the idea, more generally, is that children ask questions to learn about the things around them and to extend their knowledge of what things are and how they actually work. In particular, we know that uh, children ask domain appropriate questions. For example, they are more likely to ask about the um, food um, preferences or the typical location of animals, but more likely to ask about the function of artificial objects they're presented with. And they also have reasonable expectations about which responses count as answers to, that, to, to their questions. And if you haven't read this paper, this is really one of my favorite papers like of all time. And the idea is that uh, this is really the first paper proving that children do not just ask questions to engage their parents into conversation to keep them going, but they really ask questions because they want answers to these questions. So what they did was to um, basically uh, trying to look at how children react to their parents' answers to their questions. And the idea is that when parents give them satisfactory or explanatory answers, children are more likely to move on or uh, to stop asking questions. But when they receive uh, answers from their parents, they're just kind of dismissive or not explanatory, they're way more likely to continue asking the same questions or to be even at some point to provide their own explanation when they're really desperate. Um, and uh, we also know that children preferentially question reliable and knowledgeable informants. So this is a whole line of research which is super interesting that tries to look at how sensitive children are to uh, the knowledge or reliability of their informants, so whether they would be able to decide in different situations whom they want to ask questions to. What this, um, what this literature has uncovered is, um, is the question, do children, so, okay, we know that they can tailor whom to ask questions to, what kind of questions to ask, but are children's questions good? And of course, to look at whether children's questions are good and how good a question is in general depends on the situation this question is asked. So let's play another game. So this is Toma, and yesterday Toma was late for school. And the question is like, why was Toma late for school? Let's suppose we have these four possible reasons for Toma being late for school. He woke up late, couldn't find his jacket, couldn't find one sock, which happens very often, or his bike was broken. And I call this a uniform distribution because over the past four days, Toma was late once for each of these reasons. So again, you have to find out why Toma was late for school again, by asking as few yes no questions as possible, what would you ask? Where clothes involved? Where clothes involved? Very good question. This is a very good question because, as I said before, whatever my answer is, yes or no, you're going to be able to rule out two of the four given hypotheses. This type of question is called constraint seeking question. Constraint seeking questions aim at ruling out multiple hypotheses at each step of the search process by targeting features that are shared by different hypotheses. 
Now, let's suppose we have again these four possible reasons for Toma being late for school. But this time, I tell you that they're not all equally likely to be the solution, the reason why Toma is late for school today. So let's suppose Toma is very often late because he wakes up late, sometimes because he doesn't find his jacket, but very rarely he's late because he cannot find one sock or because his bike is broken. Now again, you have to find out why Toma is late for school again today. What kind of question would you ask? Did he wake up late? Did he wake up late? So even if you, even if you would have not asked this question, you can at least see the temptation of asking such a question, right? So this, uh, I forgot to say this, this kind of distribution of likelihood is called skew distribution, which is not beautiful. Uh, this type of question is called hypothesis scanning in the literature. Hypothesis scanning question targets single individual hypothesis, so that if the answer is yes, game is over. And of course, it's very tempting here because you're kind of, you know, like you get this hint that most probably uh, Toma will be late again because he woke up late. Why shouldn't we try to get a quick win asking this direct question? So, um, because constraint-seeking questions are able to rule out, as I said before, multiple hypotheses at each step of the switch process, they're traditionally considered better, more effective, more efficient than hypothesis kind of questions. But as we have just seen in our little Toma example, this is not always the case. There are situations, depending on how the likelihood structure is presented in the environment we're considering, in which asking an hypothesis kind of question actually makes more sense. So um, what we try to do with our research is to see whether children will be able to ask different kind of questions or use different kinds of strategies in situations where they're more likely to pay off, okay? So this idea is to check whether children's active learning is sensitive to the environmental properties, and in this case, we call this a capacity for ecological learning. Um, obviously, to investigate whether children are able to rely on the type of questions that is more effective in a given environment, we need some kind of objective measure of um, how good a question is that is not relying on their type. And the measure we pick is information gain. I'm not going to go into details of this. But uh, what is important to know is that information gain is a measure uh, of how much a question reduces the entropy, that is the uncertainty, in the hypothesis space considered. We can come back to that if you want later on. I could have used many alternative measures to do this, but maybe for those of you who are more uh, competitionally oriented, it might be important to know that all the uh, all the results I'm going to present would not, um, I mean, for, for all the results I'm going to present, it's not going to make any difference which kind of measure you use. They will all kind of give the same predictions. So um, I'm going to present the results of three and maybe half projects related to the development of ecological learning. Uh, what I think is interesting about this project taken together, and especially interesting considering the scope of the workshop today, is that they're all investigating the same questions, but with different age groups. Therefore, I was kind of forced to find every time a different, a slightly different paradigm that would tackle the same questions using the same computational framework, using the same theoretical background, but still would use a different paradigm and design uh, in order to address uh, different difficulties children different ages might have. Um, so the first um, study is with seven, ten-year-olds and adults and has to do with question generation. The second involves five-year-olds and has to do with question selection. The third has to do with action selection. You see how uh, much like less and less variable this is getting. And this is with three to five-year-olds. And in the last study, if I get to this, uh, this is a study with infants who are piloting now 12 and 8 months old, and this has to do with selective attention. So it's just, it's a looking time study. It's an eye tracking study. All right, so I'm just going to give you a, like really like fragments of the results I got from the study. So the idea is really just to give you an, a, like a feeling of the kind of methods uh, I used. Um, so the first study, um, what we tried to do, it's very similar to the kind of examples I gave you before. We had seven and ten year olds, as well as adults, asking questions to find out why John was late for work. 
So children were actually generating questions from scratch. Um, the design is very simple. It's a between subject design. Children were either, children participants were either assigned to a uniform environment or to a skewed environment. And they were given a bunch of reasons that were possible solutions why John could be late for work again. And they basically had to find why John was late for work again by asking as few questions as possible, exactly as in the example we played together. Um, so there is something weird there, but it doesn't matter. So the idea is that um, in the skewed distribution, we gave them a hint of how likely each of these solution was to be the correct reason why uh, John was late for work again. So we told them that this first two hypotheses were high frequency, so we're more likely to be the correct solution. This four hypothesis had medium likelihood, and this four hypothesis had low likelihood. So in this situation, children, participants in general, could have attempted a quick win by asking one question, a hypothesis kind of question that targeted the most likely hypothesis. In this situation, however, children were kind of more forced to ask a constraint seeking question. If they wanted to ask an hypothesis kind of question, they would have just had to choose randomly a, a question to start with. They just had no idea how to parse this um, space. Are there questions about the design? Yes. Did you present these options to the kids like this, or like the icons you, sh you showed us previously? So, um, not as before, and not like this. Uh, they, um, so children were given basically 20 cards. On each card, there was um, one of the hypotheses written on, and we read them all aloud. And then for the skewed distribution on the back of the card, there was uh, both a label, high, medium, and low frequencies, but also um, and the, the, the probability was also expressed in frequency terms. Like 10 out of 40 times in the previous days, John was late for this reason, 10 out of 40 times, or 4 out of 40 times, or 1 out of 40 times. And we had a little training at the beginning, which we made sure that they got the frequencies and the probabilities, and um, we had the same information here, obviously, but they were just uniformly distributed, and we also had a check at the end to make sure that they got it right, and they did. So text-based on the card? Sorry? So text-based on the card? Yeah, text-based on the card. We read everything aloud, we make sure they get it, they can play with the cards, they can rearrange them, they can turn them over. You know, there is no time limit, so... We're talking about seven and ten-year-olds, so they're right. Just another clarification question on the design. So they, they get multiple questions, so you know, it's not just one shot per... They get as many questions as they okay. need to get to the solution. So what were the, were the answers, were they told if they were right or not? Because sometimes a high choice will be wrong, right? Yes, the solution, the solution was picked according to the probability. So here okay. the solution was uh, 1 out of 20, they would get it right, so it was picked basically by a random generator, yeah. and here they, they were more likely to get the solution right away if they picked a right. high, you know, it and was really like... told straight after answering? Yes, okay. when they got to the solution, the game was over, so like, oh great, you got it. And uh, the solution they got, um, the distribution of the solutions they got was proportionate to the frequency of the distributions we presented to them to start with. Um, with the um, skewed distribution, because these ones look like they're quite plausible, so that the high ones are things that might happen more often than the low ones. Are. Is that how you have them set up? Yes. There, there was a very extensive piloting phase okay. in which we had, I think, to start something like 100 reasons why John could be late for work. Because of course, especially thinking about seven-year-olds, we didn't want to override what they thought would be probable or not. So we've actually had all this pre-piloting, having just random like other children and adults rating how likely they thought this would be as a reason for somebody to be late for work. And then we picked the two most likely and four kind of in the medium range and four in the low range, considering the averages of this pilot. And we ended up with the set we really didn't want uh, our children to say like, oh, come on, it happens so often, you know, that somebody's late for school because, or for work, because a dog uh, chased him so from the So does that street. mean that you have to have different examples in the uniform distribution because they all have to be a similar ability? Uh, for the uniform distribution, we chose uh, 20 
that were all rated as medium. So we went for the medium range. Other questions? Did the experimenter know what the right answer was? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because he had to give feedback. Yes, no. Oh, I thought maybe it was on an iPad or like something with yeah. just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was on an iPad and the experimenter read it on the iPad. There was kind of a random generator. It was a computer actually, not an iPad. Okay. The random generator, then he sees and what the answer is and then he can give feedback. And uh, the, the children, the participants in general, knew that the experimenter knew and would give appropriate feedbacks. All right. Results. Again, it's one slide. I left here, study one, so this is a long uh, series of studies. I'm only going to present to you the results of this first study. Of course, it's like it's basically impossible to see, but you use your spatial um, <laughs> like, um, cognition. There is a bar on the left and one on the right. This cluster is seven year olds, this cluster is 10 year olds, this cluster is adults, and the height of the bar is the percentage of constraint seeking questions asked. So here the idea is that first of all you can observe a developmental trend, so adults, and this is kind of confirming previous literature, are more likely to ask constraint seeking questions as compared to children, but what is interesting is that all participants ask a higher proportion of constraint seeking questions in the uniform distribution condition. So they also ask a higher proportion, therefore, of hypothesis kind of questions in the skewed condition where they were more likely to pay off. And um, I said this already, in general adults ask a higher proportion of constraint seeking questions than ordinary children. But what is really interesting is that if you if you look at the difference between these two bars, and you consider that a proxy for how adaptive participant strategies were, you can see that this, different, this difference is not developing with age. So adults do not adapt to their question asking strategies more promptly than older or younger children do. This is kind of the only slide of results, so if you have questions, that's the time. <laughs> Does it mean if they didn't ask a constraint seeking question, did they ask the hypothesis? Yes, it's, it's binary. Yes. So basically, the coding is very easy. If it targets only one of the cards, is hypothesis scanning. If it targets more than one card, it's constraint seeking. So for this first study, everything was pretty, pretty basic because it's the first study we run with this method. So results are clear, right? Can I move on? All right. So what about younger children? Um, so previous research shows that although even four-year-olds are able to ask some kind of constraint-seeking questions from scratch, those constraint-seeking questions four-year-olds generate are not the most effective available. Now, asking questions has two components, a generative component and a selection component. So the generative component has to do with the ability to generate questions from scratch. And the selective component has to do with the ability of selecting between two given or self-generated questions the most effective, right? Now generation from scratch is a very complicated process. We have seen this before. It involves like verbal ability, so one has to um, for example, group objects according to different categories, being able to label these categories, decide which categories should be targeted, then being able to formulate a proper, appropriately a question that targets that category and so on. So it's a very complex process we're talking about four or five year olds. So what we're trying to do here is to see whether children can already identify which of two questions is the most effective one even if they're not able yet to generate the most effective questions from scratch. And um, so again, we're talking about four and five-year-olds. Children were presented with a storybook describing the reasons why Toma was late for school over several days. So they were told on day one, Toma was late because he couldn't find his jacket. On day two, Toma was late because his bike was broken, and so on. And eventually, children, half of the children were presented with a uniform condition, so a uniform distribution, and half of the children were presented sorry, with a skewed condition. In a skewed condition, Toma had been late over the past eight days for five times because he woke up late, and for three 
times for different reasons. Okay? This is only one of the scenarios we use. We had six or seven different scenarios in which we used other clip parts, other reasons, and other categories that had to be targeted to kind of reduce the idiosyncrasy, uh, the possible um, yeah, preferences children might have had for different categories. Is there a reason why the one has six days and one has eight days? Or? Yeah, because um, we didn't want to, to um, so we tried to control more for the number of unique reasons children have to keep in mind, and we didn't want to go to eight because otherwise it would be like too many uh, different things they have to kind of um, remember. Do they, do they believe that these reasons are genuine by the end? Because it seems like they're more excuses for Thomas. Do they, uh, <laughs> do they say, these are the reasons that he gave, or these are actually genuine reasons why he was right? Uh, man, I never, I never thought about that, and I never got this question. I think they did, but it's also clear to them that that's a game. It's yeah. kind of, you know, you're just going to have to base your judgment on what I tell them, or what I tell you. Uh, no, what is interesting is that there were really like lots of children were upset by the bike yeah. because they were like Toma is not going to be able to bike with those short legs. <laughs> this is like a common we got so much that eventually we had to substitute this with a skateboard <laughs> because they were like no Toma I'm sorry this doesn't work. So this makes me think that somehow they were paying attention to what we were presenting and some of the reasons they judged as completely unlikely. Well, I think when they're older, you know, they're probably sometimes late themselves or get better at making up excuses. They might not see it as the same kind of time. Maybe, but, but, but you know, but we told them, you know, like Tomo was late because of this yeah. reason. So Obviously we didn't say told. like Tomo told me yeah. he yeah. was late for those reasons. Yeah. So I think they just kind of played along. Um, if yeah. Any more questions? So this is between subjects. Hmm? Um, then children were told that today Tomo was late for school again and that his friends, Dex and Wag wanted really to know why Toma was late for school again. And Toma really didn't want to tell them. He's like, no, I'm not going to tell you. You have to find out. You can ask me questions to find out. And the first of you finding out is going to win a big prize. Super general label, like the big prize, exciting enough. Who cares what the prize is? Doesn't really matter. So children then were presented with the two friends monster, each of them asking one question. One monster always asks, an hypothesis cutting question, the other monster always asks a constraint seeking question. Of course, we randomize the assignment of type of question to the monsters, and as I said, we use different sets of uh, hypotheses and different scenarios um, to kind of uh, get rid of preferences children might have. And uh, what is important to notice is that in the uniform distribution, asking a constraint seeking question is more effective. Whereas in the skew distribution, asking an hypothesis scanning question is more effective. And this makes sense to you, right? All right. So again, one slide of results. This is what we found. Um, so the green bar is constraint seeking. So preference given to the monster was constraint seeking. And red is basically children identifying the monster asking the hypothesis scanning question as the winner. And as you can see, about 70% of the children correctly identify the monster asking constraint seeking question as the winner in the uniform distribution environment and vice versa in the student environment. And that's within subjects? Between subjects. It's between subjects. And uh, again, this is the first study of a series of five studies we run in which we um, use different scenarios, but also different um, um, distributions in terms of like how long the, how many days we presented children as previous uh, frequencies, and we also had a one-shot and a two-shot experiment in which they were also given feedback to the first question, and they had to ask follow-up questions. So we tried to see whether children would stick with the question they asked before, whether they would be able to change the type of question if needed or not, and somehow we always get this um, this kind of pattern. So five and four-year-olds are really, really good at picking the question that is more effective considering uh, the problem, the structure of the problem they're facing. So the kind of conclusion we got from this is that, yeah, maybe four and five-year-olds are not yet that good at generating good, the most effective questions from scratch, but the computational foundation of this question-asking ability 
is already quite developed at age four and five. What about even younger children? So the biggest challenge I had for this like two, three years I've been working, yes. So, so, so but, but they could always only choose one or the other, right? Yes. So. Chats 50%. Yeah, yeah, so why would, like, uh, your hypothesis getting sort of amount could just come out by saying to you, right? Sorry? But, like, the, that amount of children choosing hypothesis getting uh, or, or constraint seeking uh, methods could just be changed instead of a foundation, right? No, if it was chance would be 50 50, but it's 70 30, 70 30. And it's constantly 70 30 across all the experiments we run. Yeah, okay. of course. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, um, and uh, I mean, it's uh, what what, it, what is interesting here is that this 70 30 is kind of what we really got stuck with. So we tested, I think, I don't know, 500, 600 children uh, in this kind of paradigm, and we always got 70 percent and 30 percent, um, even when they had to do multiple shots. Um, so the feeling is that there is really like something, some kind of. Uh, some kind of, it, it's, a, it's kind of a rock, so there is a point in which by age five some children still struggle and we haven't tested all the children but of course the fact that seven-year-olds can really generate this kind of questions from scratch made, made me think that uh, probably we'll get 100% um, full accuracy by age seven. Okay? So again, like what about younger children? So the, the, the big challenge we had is that yeah, this is all very neat, but it's a question asking paradigm. Already with four year olds, understanding questions was kind of borderline. Some kids, you know, got lost while we were reading them the storybook. They just were more interested in knowing, like, I don't know, like, um, tell us, you know, what, what kind of game does <laughs> Toma like to play, you know, like, like, okay, maybe it doesn't really work. So, uh, what we're trying to do is to find a non verbal correspondent to our question asking paradigm that would be suitable to investigate younger children. And that's what we came up with. So this is a study that targets three to five year olds and it's an action selection study and you're gonna see that somehow the background um, is really, really identical. So participants were presented with this egg shaker. You know what an egg shaker is? You shake it and it makes like ch -ch -ch -ch. Um, and then there was a light-up toy, and the goal of the game was to find where the egg shaker was, so they could put it on this light-up toy, and the light-up toy will activate and make like sound and uh, light, and again, very exciting. So children really wanted to find the egg shaker so they could play with the toy. And uh, this is again a between subject uh, manipulation. Children were um, presented, all of them, with two big boxes. One big box was black and the other big box was white and each of those big boxes contained two smaller colored boxes inside. So the black box um, had inside a red smaller box and a yellow smaller box and the white big box had a blue smaller box and a green smaller box inside exactly as in the picture. Um, the idea is that the experimenter place the egg shaker in one of the four smaller boxes and then ask the kid to retrieve the egg shaker. The kid had observed the entire kind of hiding or placement scene and then children could put this egg shaker they just retrieved on the light-up toy. And the experimenter placed the egg in a small box four times. In the uniform distribution condition, the experimenter always placed the egg shaker in a different small box. Whereas, guess what, in this good condition, the experimenter always placed the egg shaker in the same colored small box. So four times the egg shaker is placed, the child retrieves it, puts it on the light-up toy, and so on. And after each placement, the experimenter would kind of underline, like highlight, what he was saying or what he was doing by saying, you see, in this game, I always place the egg in a different box. And here would say, you see, in this game, I always place the egg in the same box. Okay, would repeat this four times. 
And this is again between subjects. Then children are presented with two actions they could perform to find out if a big box contains the egg shaker in one of the two smaller boxes inside. So one thing children can do is to shake. You shake the big box and then you're going to hear if the egg shaker is in one of the two smaller boxes inside, right? The other thing you can do obviously is to open the box. You open the big box, you open the two little smaller box inside and eventually you're going to find out if the egg shaker is, is in one of, of the two smaller boxes. Um, at test, so children are demonstrated these strategies, they get their chance to shake the box, to open the box. Shaking is uh, fun, opening is also fun, there are all this kind of uh, strips they have to, to open, there are all these rings, it's not that uh, trivial to open the box, it takes uh, quite some time to practice with that, so it's something they really like to do. Um, and at test they're presented again with the two bigger boxes they were presented with during uh, the distribution training at the beginning. And this time they're told, okay, you're going to close your eyes and I'm going to hide the egg shaker in one of the small boxes again. And then you have to find it. So try to close the eyes. The experimenter places the egg shaker in one of the first boxes, closes all boxes, and then the child has to find out where the egg is. And the command, the instruction, the experiment it gives the child is the following. Okay, now you have to find the egg shaker so that you can place it and play with the toy, but you can open only one big box. Okay, you can open only one big box. You make sure kids get it, and then they can go. So what is the idea? If children are in the uniform condition, they just have no idea where the egg shaker could be, if they just go and open one box, they wouldn't know which box to open, and they really risk, with 50% probability, to open the wrong box. And in theory, they wouldn't be allowed to open the second box, so they will lose the opportunity to play with the light-up toy. But in the, in the skid condition, the experimenter always hit the egg shaker in the green small box. Why should I waste my time shaking boxes if I now that it's exactly there because that's what experimenter told me. He plays this game. So, and this shaking action corresponds to asking a constraint-seeking question in a uniform kind of distribution environment. You don't know anything about that. You need to kind of use a more top-down strategy. You shake the box first. And this really corresponds to an hypothesis kind of question. You have a strong intuition of where the object is hidden. You just go and try this out, because you cannot resist the urge of finding this egg shaker and place it on this way. Does this make sense? And this is what we found. Um, these are three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, and this is the percentage of children who shook the box as first action. Um, I think um, you can see how this graph resembles the first graph question asking a present with seven, ten-year-olds and adults. So the first thing to notice is that we have the same kind of developmental trend towards um, um, performing more shaking actions and that's something we got with adults as well with asking constraint seeking questions. But what is interesting is that three and four-year-olds really changed the kind of action they perform depending on the environment, which is very surprising, whereas five-year-olds did not which was very disappointing. <laughs> now, I, okay, are there questions about this, besides this kind of puzzling result with five-year-olds? Um, if they find that in the um, skewed condition, if they go straight to the right box and it's not there, it how, how long does it take them to adapt? And, Change to a This is something we haven't done. Okay. Uh, so so far there was like no deception in the in the skewed condition. Okay. We told them I always had it here. We always hid it there. Um, but but this is interesting. Of course uh, the the idea would be to try to have a training study yeah. in which at some point we change the condition and we try to see how long it would take before they change the strategy um, they implement in the game. That's very interesting. Um, but um, also because that's another meaning that it's given to adaptiveness, uh, which is like not, so it's more like within subject adaptiveness, whereas what we have here is more between subject adaptiveness, which we look at like big groups. Um, 
So um, why did five-year-olds fail here? Um, there are several possible explanations. Uh, the, uh, the first thing I thought about is that somehow, I mean, you would not get punished by shaking the box before opening it, right? So the idea is that if you're kind of not really sure of what the experimenter said, you think like, oh, this is too easy. You told me you hide it in the green box and you asked you know, ask me to find it. You just told me there must be some, there's something fishy going on here. I'm just going to shake to make sure you actually told me the truth and that's where I'm going to find the egg. So we thought this is why five-year-olds shook in both conditions. However, we, run, we now finish running a new version with five-year-olds in which we implement an incentive system in which, in theory, um, children are incentivized not so basically they would shake only if really needed. Okay, so they're given one sticker and they are told, okay, you have to pay the sticker to shake the box. But if you find the egg in the first box you open, then you got three stickers. We make sure they understand the conditions, and uh, we see that both bars lower down, meaning the children are less kind of willing to give up the one sticker they got right away, so they're kind of more risky uh, prone, uh, but they still do not change their behavior in the two conditions. And do they always shake the box that they think it is in rightly? No. No, no but that also doesn't, uh, I mean, in, a, in an information kind of theoretical sense, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't matter sense, because yeah. But it um, could be, yeah. yeah no, they don't have any kind of a confirmatory or falsificatory yes. kind of uh, approach. So what we're trying to do now, it's our last attempt, is to use um, a computer-based um, um, task in which uh, there is no experimenter. So all the kind of things children might think about the experimenter trying to uh, trick them or you know playing some kind of theory of mind or the experiment or the task being too easy. We try to get rid of all these things by having um, a simple iPad game in which these are the rules and that's how the program and the game works. And we try to see if in this situation five year olds will be uh, more performing as three and four year olds. And sorry, another question. Did you ever ask them? Yes. And or, yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, the problem with um, five-year-olds, and obviously it's even worse with three and four-year-olds, is that they do postdoc justifications of what they've done. So in this case, they would just kind of find reasons why they did what they did. They, but that means they do not ask, reconstruct why they did what they did. That means that you ask them why. You did not ask them how to develop the task or something. We told them, like, in the, in the in the last version we run, the one we just finished collecting, we asked them why did you decide to shake or why did you decide to... Uh, to These why questions are, are known to um, exaggerate confabulations, why how questions are not so like that. So that's, um, it's one of the ways that has been... Yes, I, I believe we ask both. Yeah. Um, we, uh, we ask both and we even have a version in which they had to to explain to another child, like just like record a video, I don't remember, we tried a little bit of everything, but record a video in which you explain to another child how to okay. approach this yes. task. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We even run this at a preschool and it was interesting because we, we thought we could test all the children in the preschool and then we run it with two children and within 10 minutes everybody knew, it was like, <laughs> you've got to shake, you've got to shake. It's like, no, it doesn't work like this. <laughs> So we burned the entire testing site for for this experiment. Um, yeah. So somehow it's um, yeah, it, it's a lot about the action and what we usually got is like, oh, I shook because um, it's fun or because you have to shake. Yeah, but why do you shake? Because it's fun. <laughs> yeah. So we didn't get much reasons for that. And even when you tried to explain, they only said like what the other kid was supposed to do and not why. Um, do you have five more minutes? Three? Um, yeah, I, th I mean, I, this is the last thing, so I, like, I, I think we can, we can give four, five more minutes, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I just want to show you, like, this, it's also, I don't have results. It's um, a design we just um, kind of came up with, so maybe I can get some feedback, that's my, that's the part I'm interested in at the moment. Um, 
on trying to test the same questions with infants. Of course, you like even more challenging, they cannot really do anything. We're talking about 12 and 18 months old. So um, the idea is that we try to see again whether they would um, understand at this time, because they cannot perform actions, but whether they would understand that some search actions are more effective in some situations as compared than other situations. So what we do is we have three phases. One phase is, I'm going to explain you all phases like in a minute. In a first phase, we tell them how this game works. So there is a grid, and we just tell them how this grid is searched in this game. I'm going to give an example in a second. And there are two ways this grid can be searched in a linear fashion, that is hypothesis scanning, one kind of piece of the grid at a time, or in a binary fashion, constraint seeking, half the space, half of the half of the remaining space, and so on. And then we have a familiarization phase in which they see a frog jumping across the grid and they understand that finding a frog is cool, lights, sounds, very exciting. Not finding a frog is not cool. It's like blah, 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 very sad. And then there is a test part in which we show them the frog jumping around and then this kind of search grid, kind of search kind of pattern coming on and we try to see whether children are surprised or not, depending on what happens. I'm going to give you examples. Here's the linear search. So this is just, oops, maybe it just goes along. It's supposed to do something. Yes. So the grid is there, grid is closed, and that's just what they see. This is how this grid is searched. And this is a linear search. In the binary search, so they get to the end of it. In the binary search, they see the same. This is the grid. The grid is covered. Maybe not. Sorry. Yes. We discovered, and this time it's searched in a binary fashion. First, the bottom half, then it's a little slower because we want the total exploration time to be the same across conditions, then it's top, um, left half, and so on. Then there is a familiarization. This is the condition in which they were trained on linear search and they got a positive feedback. So there's a frog, frog is bouncing around. Sorry, I think I clicked. Yes, so the frog is bouncing around. And then at some point, the grid closes, comes the search, goes the wrong place, very sad, you don't um, hear the sound, but it's like blah, 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 blah. And here is what happens if actually the search finds the frog. The frog goes somewhere, grid closes, search comes in, finds the frog, and this is super exciting. That, uh, that's kind of sound. So, then we have two test blocks. So the linear binary search they're trained on is between subjects, but then the two test grids are with that subject. So they know how the grid is searched in this game, but they don't know what happens on the grid. And they're going to be presented with one skewed grid in which the frog is shown to bounce always between the first and the second square. Always, 16 times, boom, 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 boom. And then only once goes here and then comes back. So basically it's uh, 14 jumps here, 14 jumps here, one jump here. Okay, that's a kind of proportion. So what's the idea? The linear search comes in and goes here because that's the first square that is explored in the linear search whereas the constraint seeking the binary search would explore this bottom half, right? This is between conditions. Now, children that were trained in a search would kind of be bored. Like, uh, obviously, obviously we found the frog. The frog has always been there and jumped there for like 15 minutes. The linear search comes in, we find the frog, not surprising. But the kids that were trained in a binary search, if 
the frog is found, then you're going to be surprised because the, you know, the frog was jumping here all the time. Mm. Only once the frog was here. So they should be surprised. What's the idea, obviously, is that if they really show this kind of pattern, then they understood that this kind of search is not really efficient in this kind of environment. It's surprising that it worked, whereas this kind of search in this environment is quite efficient, and they're not surprised that it works. Uniform grid, now you've got the kind of idea. This time, the frog is jumping and touching all the quadrants of the grid twice. And then the linear search comes in. Remember, this time the frog has been jumping here only twice. This. Or the binary search comes in. Half of the time, the frog has been jumping in the lower part of the grid. If they were training linear search, this time I would be surprised. Like, oh man, really? It was so unlikely to find it, but we managed. And the binary search would be like, well, obviously. It's kind of like very likely. So the idea is, if we find this kind of combined behavior, remember this, is, this part is within subjects, so they get both grids, then we should have a feeling that infants understand that some exploratory strategies are more efficient in some environments, but not in others, and vice versa. We haven't run this yet. <laughs> We're still at the piloting uh, phase in which we try to see whether children would at least understand that uh, uh, that, uh, so whether looking time would track their surprise, like in more general terms. So now we only have the, um, the skewed grid. So now we, we just have the skewed grid, and we have the, the linear search coming in where the frog is supposed to be, and we try to see if infants are bored, and we have the linear search coming in here, and if they find a frog, children should be super surprised. So we're trying to explore the extremes so that we have some kind of calibration. And if they're not able to do this, obviously everything else is quite challenging, but hopefully they're going to be able to do this, and we can try to build on that to do this more complicated design. This is just to give you an idea uh, of another method that's still looking at exactly the same questions, but it's very, very um, different. And this is an interesting study. That's it. So. Thank you very much. Yeah, these are our partners in Berlin. Uh, we work mainly in museums. Uh, and that's where we got all our children. And uh, this is my lab. <laughs>